hope for the United States, we pray for the world, that people will come to know you and to love you and to understand your ways are higher than our ways so that we can be light in darkness. We thank you for today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, God bless you. Good to see you this morning. Happy Easter, everybody. Hey, let's stand and let's begin to worship the Lord.
He is risen. Jesus died, he said that the same power that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in us. Well, this opens up a whole new world to us because now he says that we can come in prayer and believe him for all the things that we think are impossible. Now, a lot of people today, especially sensational, sensationists, will say that God doesn't do that anymore. We believe that he is able and willing to do because the same power that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in us. So every week during worship, I invite some of our prayer team, and I'm so thankful for them. They, we have a whole team ministry of people saying, I will join and partner with people in prayer and agree with them. And the Bible says, wherever two more agree on anything, it shall be done. So if you need something from God today, you need healing, you need a breakthrough in your finances, you need something that you're not able to get by yourself, come join one of the prayer partners up here and let them pray with you and for you and let's see God do some breakthroughs today. The same power that raised Christ, not only is we going to spend all eternity with him in, hev in heaven, but he's made available and give us access 
to all the things that we need to help us down here. So if you need prayer, join us up here. Father, thank you that you're a God that answers prayer, that nothing's too difficult for you. And so, Lord, we simply trust that you're at work even when we don't see it, even when we don't understand it. Show us how to navigate and to follow you as you lead us. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Let's begin. If you need prayer, join them. Let's continue to worship.
Our God is great, isn't he? He is that he is.
Lord, you are worthy, Lord, you are worthy, you are worthy. You are worthy. As, as we were worshiping, I was just overwhelmed by this sense of longing for hearts to just be restored to a faith of that it once was. I think we've all been through situations. We've had faith of our youth and faith when we were young, and we had so much hope for what our future held. And then sometimes life just is life. Life lifes us. And we experience things that make us question who God is and how we experience his love sometimes in the midst of all kinds of pain and difficulty and, tra and, and tragedy. And I think that it's Resurrection Sunday, and the enemy will deceive us into thinking that there's no hope for um, all of the dead things to be risen again. Anything that is broken in your life, anything that you once had hope for that is now gone or you just kind of like given up, today's the day to ask the Lord what he has for that space. He can redeem anything. He can restore anything. There is nothing so dead that the Lord can't raise it. Awesome, thank you. Well, you may be seated if you can. We're, there's so many things to be thankful for, and today's service is probably going to be a little different for you today. And it's intended that way, so bear with us as we, as we uh, do things a little differently today. And you'll see in a moment. Uh, real quickly, I just want to thank the outreach team. We had an outreach uh, give out, Greg, how many thousands of <laughs> eggs yesterday? And, and sure enough, as your you know, whole team prepares and they pray and they go out and they set this up. Of course, on Facebook, I get somebody texting in saying, it's not about Easter eggs. We're like, duh. No, what it's about is that we love people and we want to reach them where they're at. And if an Easter egg can be the invitation to come closer to God, then by all means, bring on the Easter eggs. But it's not about the Easter egg. It's not about the bunnies. We know that. It's about the resurrection power of Jesus. And so we had, I addressed it with her and said, listen, D.L. Moody one time said, a lady came up to him. She says, I don't like the way you're evangelizing. He goes, well, how do you do it? She goes, I don't. He goes, I like my way better. You know, there's nobody that's doing it perfect, but I tell you what, we got a team here that loves people outside God's family, and they'll do whatever it takes to make sure that no one gets left behind. And so we're thankful for that team, our outreach team. I want to thank the prayer team this morning. Week after week, year after year, they're stirring up pockets of prayer we're hearing answers to prayer all the time, so we're grateful for that. And of course, uh, our worship team, week after week after week, they, they just pull through and, and give themselves um, to the Lord, so we're thankful for that. Well, without further ado, there's a number of great announcements. We're going to play them because I want you to know that you're invited to everything you hear on the screen. It's an invitation for you to to maybe stir up your spiritual life and join uh, with a, a, we have a mobile team going to prayer in St. Louis this week. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, all sorts of things. There's called the Around Town Challenge. You can still get in today if you, I think, can they? Yep. We can still get you in today. We have teams of people going to get, have a lot of fun. They're going to get together in groups and follow this, um, what do you call it, Chris? Yeah. A scavenger hunt. You'll get clues together as a team. You'll figure out the clues. And the first one back with all the clues uh, wins. But then we're going to have dinner together and just enjoy uh, someone speaking into our life about how we can improve our marriage and how we can improve our life. And so if you, you know, if everyone signed up right now, we'd, we'd make room for you. Uh, so do that today and go online at our website and sign up, registration, or see the Connect booth on the way out. Let's go ahead and those announcements. I'll be back up. And then I'll tell you how crazy our service is going to be. Good morning, Bay Valley. Thanks for joining us today on Easter Sunday. Hey, guys, we want to try to connect with you. So why don't you take a look underneath the seat in front of you and grab that connect card and fill it out for us. And turn it into a team member after service in the back. And be sure to download our app. We are continuing our Monday night prayer caravan on the road. We will be heading to seven different churches to ignite in prayer. Be sure to join us this week on Monday, April 1st at a Real Life Church in St. Louis at 6.30 p.m. The caravan will be leaving here at 6 p.m. Be sure to check our app or visit the Connect booth for more information. Coming soon. 
April 6, 2024. The Around the Town Challenge. Adventure out through Bay City. Having fun. Making memories. Are you up for the challenge? Sign up today. Scripture says we should raise a child in the way that they should go. If you want your child to be raised as a follower of Jesus Christ and have a child that you would like to have dedicated, please join us April 14th at either of our morning services. You may sign up at the Connect booth or online. Every year we take a group of youth out to California to further their walk with Jesus. Impact will be hosting a fundraiser dinner on April 19th. We'll be serving Alfredo and lasagna and good vibes. Join us between 6 and 8 for either takeout or dine-in. Talk to Ethan for any pre-orders. Thank you for listening. And for more information on upcoming events, please download our app or look us up online at bayballeycc.org. Peace. All right. Well, two quick more announcements. Number one, uh, we believe that when Jesus wanted to talk to the disciples about something really important, it wasn't always to a classroom. It was to go for a walk, to travel with the disciples and meet them on the road uh, uh, to a, a mountain. So one of the things we do here is we take young people out to California, spend a week mentoring them, helping them find direction for their life. When they come back, uh, the Lord helps direct their steps and help them fulfill their purpose. Uh, but also in June, we've got a couple trips coming up. We'd like to see some of our adults. If you're interested in signing up, I know a few people signed up already. But uh, June, I believe it's the 24th, uh, through July 1st, I think it is. Uh, we'll be taking a group of adults out to California for a week. If you're interested in doing that, uh, see me or see uh, Dana, and uh, we'll make sure that you get signed up and uh, registered and uh, have a trip of a lifetime that will impact your life, uh, I believe, that uh, forever uh, because of, of what God's able to do with us. Finally, uh, here's what this morning's going to look like. We're going to uh, hear a doorbell. Go ahead and hit the doorbell for me. All right, here's what's going to happen. Next time you hear that doorbell go off, I have three speakers this morning that are going to speak. Jeff uh, from our outreach and missions leader. We've got Chris from our, uh, our leadership uh, leader. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have them share 10 minutes. At the end of 10 minutes, hit that sound again. <laughs> Jeff won't listen to that one, I'll tell you that. There it is. Okay, there we go. Jeff will just ignore the first one, so please play it. Anyway. So we'll play the first one, and then he'll come up and speak. We'll hear it again, and then Chris will come up and speak. We'll hear it again, and I'll come up and speak. But here's what's going to happen. Every time the doorbell goes off, I'd like you to get up out of your seat. Go greet two or three people. You can move seats. You can, like, go, if you're going over to somebody else, just sit next to them. And then we'll move you again. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Pastor, I don't want to play these games. All right, don't. <laughs> S- sit there like a bump on a pickle and... Ignore us. But uh, for a lot of us, what, what it does, it gives us moments to change out speakers, and so there's not just a lot of sitting here silent. So let's move around, greet somebody, and if you want to go back to your seat, you can. Uh, but let's, let's begin. Let's go ahead and hit that doorbell. And uh, Jeff, where's Jeff? Come on, Jeff. Let's welcome Jeff this morning. Awesome. Thank you, brother. Hey, ring that doorbell again. Jesus, yeah, please, come on in. You are always my guest. Let's get the first things first, right? Let's ask him, to, let's ask him on in the house when the doorbell rings. Some of you guys, the doorbell sounds different, but he's ringing it. That's a little bit what my testimony is about today. So, I'm going to cut right to the nitty-gritty. I got 10 minutes and I'm on the clock. Whew, man, this guy told me. <laughs> I got so much to tell you about God. Mark 8, 36. What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? I could probably just mic drop it right there. So when I'm sharing my testimony, I always reference and say my B.C. life and my A.C. life as like my, my, my before Christ life and then my after Christ life. And my wife, who's always, you know, doing cool stuff to support me, she decides to spend a little money and buy me a new rocker T-shirt. Now, uh, it's a playoff for ACDC, but uh, I thought I'd just show it to you. It's pretty cool. Now, I want you to know something. Uh, 
You know, back in the day, I was riding the highway to hell. But these days, I prefer the road less traveled. And let me tell you about that. Um, first of all, the vehicle that I traveled on my highway with was pride. Anybody deal with pride? See, pride was something that was highly encouraged as a young man who was deeply influenced by his Native American father. Pride was everything. Matter of fact, got to the point when the principal just quit calling because all my dad wanted to know was, this boy that my man beat, was he bigger than him? Okay, that's all I need to know. Click. That was all he was concerned with. Otherwise, there was no honor in it, he'd say. The bigger the man, the prettier the girl, the better the trophy. I pause a little bit when I give this because sometimes it's hard to rip the Band-Aid off and check how things are healing. Okay, I'm healing good. God's healing me real good. I can peel a whole lot more of the Band-Aid off than I used to. But a little sliver of that, of my prideful life, was um, I used to fight men in the ring for money and sometimes all just for fun. And women, I could be a charmer. I learned to play a guitar and hit the gym just for you. And I didn't pray. I didn't pray to no God. I didn't, and God who? Devil who? I was my own deity. I sought my own praise and my own glory and my own fame. There's probably a few men in here that can maybe relate with some of that. And that's a small little snippet, just a very small sliver of my B.C. life before Christ. Try being married with three kids and a wife with those life skills. Uh -huh. Fifteen years later on a cold night in December, coming home 3 a.m. from a great work Christmas party, as I pull in the driveway and the lights hit the trailer, I noticed that every single door was open. Hmm. And as I walked into that gutted out house, there wasn't even a curtain left hanging. I got the message loud and clear. And I remember, <laughs> of all things, there was this old rug laying that they had used to drag out the furniture in my house. And I scooped that rug up, and I'm walking around like Linus from Snoopy, crying, and I'm laughing, and I'm crying, and I'm laughing, and I'm just hysterical, and I'm hugging that blanket because it's the only thing that I can hug that's hugging me back in this moment. And I'm walking to my baby's room, and I go, and my daughter's not there anymore. And I go to my other daughter, and she's not there anymore. And I go to my son's room, my baby son, and he's not there anymore. And I find myself walking back into my bedroom and laying down on the floor in the spot that used to be my bed, closing my eyes and praying to God, this is just some bad dream, and I'm going to wake up and be fine. Only to wake up the next morning, splitting headache. Back is killing me. And as I for once finally look in the mirror of my mind, I am disgusted at what I see in my reflection. So much so that I begin to crumble and weep like a baby. And it's in that moment that I realized and I felt a presence in that room. That I was not alone. I can't explain it. I tried to get my head wrapped around it, and the only name that would come to me is Jesus. It was the only word that would come to me of this presence that I was feeling in the room. A God that I never prayed to and acknowledged, yet was I know was in this room as I'm watching the sunlight streaming through the bare window. And I remember rolling up on my knees after reflecting, and I said, God, if you're really real, I'm asking you to help me because I'm sick and I don't want to be my God anymore. I want to be something completely different. And I got this vision in that moment of this smashed clay vase that was just laying in pieces. And it was me. And I begged God. I said, if there is even one shard of goodness in me that you can salvage, I will follow you all the days of my life. I will go where you ask me to go. I'll speak to you you want me to speak. Just don't leave me like this. 
And I said, when I find a Bible, I says, I'm just going to grab it and flip it open. Whatever my eyes fall on, I'm going to ink it on my shoulder to remember I made you this promise and keep it for once in my life. God did see a shard of goodness in me. Because in that moment, I asked God to be my God. And you know what that shard of goodness was inside of me? His son. Everyone that calls Jesus their God has a shard of goodness inside of you, whether you want to acknowledge it or not or tell yourself you're the most rottenest apple in the barrel. But if you ask God to be your God, you have a shard of goodness. That's all he sees. And that's enough. So I walked through the house after making my declaration to God. One last time, looking at the rooms, and as my hand hit the doorknob, something called me back inside the house, and of all places in the closet. And I peeked in the closet, and laying over in the corner was this brand new Bible. See how brand new it looks? And I was like, all them words that I just spoke come rushing back to my head. I said, all right, I guess here we go. All I can think of is I don't even know where the Bible came from. It must have come from my mom or my grandma or somebody, and I'm sure it was something like, oh, Grandma, you got me a brand-new Bible. You, you shouldn't have. And I threw it in the back of the closet Why it waited for me for this moment. Huh. Here's the AC life. So I took the Bible and I flipped it open. 1,283 pages in my eyes fall on the Scripture, Philippians 4.13. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. It's on this shoulder right here. And I ask God, what do you mean I can do everything? I can give you your life back. I can give you a woman of faith. I can give you a relationship with your children. I can give you joy. Let me start by giving you peace that you can go to sleep at night without watching the numbers roll over for an hour. I can do everything through he who gives me the strength. In in my tears, in his blood that he shed, he put me on his wheel and started reforming me. Now I want you to know something. I am a new vase, but I don't look nothing like the old one. But then he began to fill me. And what I'm doing up here is me overflowing. This is what it looks like when God starts to fill you, but when it gets to the top, he's still pouring into you and it just overflows, and you just got to tell people about Jesus. Because somebody is maybe me in that 30-some years back, you may be in that right now. And you're getting all twisted inside me talking about it. Because, you know, you try to hide and put on the good face coming on Easter. Oh, I just went real on him. He gave me a new life. Tell me that God does not see everything that you do and say. Tell me that he doesn't hold every tear in his hand waiting for that day that you finally come to him and say, okay, God, I'm ready. And he'll take all them tears and all his blood and mix it together and soften you up and make you into something new. He says, I make a new creation in you. I am a new creation. You talk to some of my old friends and they don't even recognize me. He gave me a new life. And it's weird is that the life that he gave me, it's almost like he's given me a redo. You see, I have two daughters and a son who are grown up now. Great relationship. God's restored them. But the weird thing about it is, is my wife now, my faith-filled wife that he bring to me, we've been married for 20 years. I have two daughters and a son again. A nine-year-old an 8-year-old and a 17-year-old Bella. Tell me that God is not the God of second chances. He gave me a second chance to do the dad thing again, to be the good husband, to be the good man. So on that, Bell, I'm just going to leave it with a mic drop. Praise you, Lord. I should be getting a clap to God, not me. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Lord. I give thanks to you. All right, let's get up. Let's move around. Go say hi to somebody. Shake their hand. Chris. Beautiful. What's up, buddy? Hey, Nicole.
All right, family, let's settle back in. Hey, how many out there are thankful that God is a God of second chances? Yes. Happy Easter. It's Resurrection Sunday. And you know what? We're just going to proclaim that he is alive. And that means so much to us because what was dead has been brought to life. And today we're celebrating that resurrection power of Jesus Christ that, that remains with us and that we can take hold of and take power of. But we don't want it just to end with us. We've got to be asking ourselves, how do we tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ? How do I tell somebody about the gospel message? How do I tell somebody that no matter what they've done, that God will always forgive them, that he'll love you, that he'll bless you, that he'll fight for you? Just tell them how he changed your life. Just tell them your testimony. For me, I call it my love story with God. And so I'd like to share just a little bit of that with you right now. So you want to hear about my before Jesus moment in my life. I'm not so sure that I had one. My mom's over here. I think I came out of my mom's womb as a khaki pants Christian. I was dressed up and ready for, for church. I mean, I was speaking Christianese before English. Mom's that true? No, she doesn't know. It was mumble jumble. So I remember we, I'd go to Sunday school. I'd go to Christian school the other five days of the week. So that gave me a good Sabbath day, one day of rest on that seventh day. I remember I played church ball. Uh, I was in the church band. And all that to say is I am so grateful that my parents saw it valuable to put me around and in the proximity of the word of God, that it might take hold in me. The word says train a child up in the way he should go and he won't depart far from it. I'm going to tell you something. I put that scripture to the test. I wanted to see how elastic it was, just like most 16-year-olds do. I was pushing the limits. But I learned a lot when I was walking back and forth towards and away from God there that it's not about how much you have in your head, but it's about how much you let God transform what's in your heart. And so I, I'd just like to say this, guys, it's not about how much you know. It's not about what you know in your head. It's not about the devil knows the word of God. You hear me on that? You can know the word of God and you can still be way off. Just look at Solomon. He was the wisest person that ever lived outside of Jesus Christ. And yet somehow, some way, he chose, like many of us do, to walk away and stray from Jesus. And so I know that Jesus, he spoke about this type of individual in, uh, in the parable of the sower, where the farmer scattered seed onto different soils. And he explained them, and Jesus, I, I most resonate with the seed that fell on the rocky ground. And Jesus said it was somebody who heard the word and receives it with joy. But because it didn't have root, but because it didn't transform, it didn't leave their head and go down to their heart and really make a difference in their life that when trouble and persecution come, they quickly fall away. For me, it was when my dad died. My sisters and I found my dad dead at the age of 16. He was my best friend. And I feel like I didn't have a purpose. I was lost after that. My whole world just shattered. And I didn't know what to do, so I just went and I tried everything that would just give me a temporary high for a short time. And everything I did was self-serving. And, and mom, I'm so sorry. I was, I was terrible to my mom. And it broke me. And I kind of just look at it. It's like four words summed me up back then. Drugs, booze, babes, and bad language. I didn't care who it was or whose it was or what it was. If it wasn't serving me, I didn't want anything to do with it. Can anybody resonate with that in their life? I, there's, there's two instances that I want to bring up. The day I went into the military, the morning that I went into the military, I should have been beside myself, and I, I should have been excited about going to serve our country and to do something that's bigger than myself. Instead, I got drunk and I... I should have got a DUI, and I got pulled over. And by the grace of God, I was still able to go to the military, one of them deals. You go to the military, and I was able to see God work in so many miraculous ways in combat and so many others, and it created this foundation of I know God is so real. But like a lot of people in life, even when you see God move in big ways in your life, you still turn back. I have a lot in common with the Israelites. They saw God do miracles, and yet they turned their back on him. 
Solomon. He knew everything there was to know, and he respected and revered, but yet he still walked away. But a few years later, I got my chance to go to jail. And so I made some silly decisions down in Bristol, Tennessee at a NASCAR race where a lot of bad decisions are made. And uh, <laughs> I started talking some smack to the wrong people. They tested me with some moonshine and I failed. And I ended up in jail. And while I was in jail, I got broke because I had to pay the court fees. I had to stick around and pay for a hotel room, I had to rent a vehicle, a flight back. But while I was in court that next week, I just so happened to miss my court appearance in Michigan for my divorce hearing. So my wife had left me, and she was divorcing me. And all I can seem to think is equate it to just this country song of a life, except I didn't have a dog, and I wasn't riding a train. And, and if you know the song, you know, I didn't have a horse either. So I guess it really wasn't even that good of a country song, but I'm just trying to tell you right now that I was doing it all the wrong way. You see, people always say that you have to make bad decisions in life, like it's a good thing to make bad decisions, like it's a good thing to come into maturity, because if you make some bad decisions, you'll finally get it. I'm not buying that trash. People always say YOLO, you know, you only live once, like it's an excuse to live in sin and to live selfishly. People say that you got to follow your own heart, that you got to trust your gut, and I just want to say that's how I got to the worst places that I ever was. I'm not trying to follow who's in my head. I'm trying to follow who's in my heart. Yeah. A lot of people always say that you don't have to focus on anyone or anything outside of yourself. A lot of people say, you know what? I just want to test drive the car to see if I like it because I really don't want to buy all in. I don't want to commit. I want to ride the fence. I want to live in the gray area. I got a question for you. What if you crash that car? What if tomorrow never comes? And now you have an eternity to think about why you chose every other lust of the flesh over Jesus Christ, who gave himself so that you could have an eternity of, perfe eternity of perfection in the presence of the one who loves you so much. And I'm grateful today, two of my friends, my best friends to this day, they saw a difference in me so long ago, and they thought my life was worth fighting for. They thought my salvation and my eternity was worth fighting for. And so they sat me down, and they listened to the scripture when it says, better a rebuke or a stern word from a brother than a kiss from an enemy. And they said, Chris, you're not acting how you're speaking. And you're not speaking how you're believing. We know that you know the word of God, but it's not, it's not in your heart. We can tell because it's not how you're acting, and we don't even know you anymore. And I remember that day, February 2008, in Okinawa, Japan, I sat in my barracks room, and I locked myself in there, and I cried all night long. And it's not because of the word that was harsh that they gave me, or the truth of it. It was because I walked away from my father, and I didn't even realize it. And I'm so grateful that we can partner with each other, that we can bring each other around and say, God, do you get this? Let me speak the truth to you. And that's what a testimony is. We're just up here trying to tell you the truth so maybe you don't make the same mistakes. And I feel like everyone gets up here all the time. And in their testimony, they always say, man, I'd love to stand up here and tell you that it got easier. But they don't. And then they say, but it got so much harder. I'm not here to tell you that. I'm here to tell you that without a doubt, my life got so much better and simpler when I accepted Jesus and I started taking him serious started letting him transform who I was. You know, since Christ, I've got words that can describe me now. I've been recycled, renewed, reborn. I've been revamped. All them are words that are, that are so fun. Like, that's what God has done for me right now. You know, I look at life as an adventure now. I'm not overwhelmed with chaos and stress. I look at life as a journey and I dream more than I ever have. I look into eternity, and I'm, and I'm ready, and I'm excited to see the King of Kings. And I speak life. I believe that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I believe that we have a God, that there is nothing impossible for him. Let me just tell you what sums me up. I want to tell you what matters most in my life. I've got the Bible. I've got the word of God, and you know what? In our family, we stand on this word, 
And it is, there's nothing more important because there's nothing more alive and active than to listen and to speak and proclaim and to pray the word of God over your family and your situation. The next thing that matters most, I've got Nikki and Loss and my family. God is a God of second chances. And I've got you guys. You guys have helped me through some of the most difficult times in this church, my church family. And then you know what? Lastly, I've got an instrument of praise in my mouth. And I will never cease to worship and magnify and glorify the King of Kings until the day that I die. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Guys, I just want to say this is who I was created to be, a man in love with God. I joked in the beginning that... I joked in the beginning that I came out of my mama's womb a khaki pants Christian. But let me tell you what, I'm reminded of the scripture, but the scripture says, before I was born, the Lord knew me. He named me and he formed me in my mother's womb. God had a plan when he created you and was always for you to be in relationship with him. And I'm just here to tell you right now that the greatest decision that I've ever made in my life was to give my life to Christ so that I could accept his new life for all of eternity. And I'm going to praise his name forevermore because of it. Right on the bell. All right, let's change around. Let's stir it up a little bit. Tell someone that you uh, appreciate them. Let's turn it around. Hey, hey, bless you. Good to see you. Hey, Sam, get back here. How are you? Good to see you. Oh, love you. Good to see you. Sweet. Oh, good to see you. Awesome. Wonderful. Bless you. Good to see you. Hi, so good to see you. How are you? Are you doing well? Well, you look great. Hi, how are you? So good to see you. Glad you're here. Awesome. All right. How are you? God bless you. So good to see you. Awesome. All right. Uh, happy Easter, McCarthy's. How are you? Doing well? Awesome. It's kind of fun when you have people that have been in your life for uh, over 40 years. You know, you can... They remember me when I was skinny. Remember those days? Remember those days? Can I remember those days? Anyway, we're, we're so glad that you're here. And what I want to really say this morning is that, that God is at work. And you just heard two stories. You heard Chris's story. You heard Jeff's story. But honestly, if you're here today saying, what in the world is going on? I could literally give you uh, all kinds of stories of people who have a similar account uh, all over this place, from the, from the goth girl, right, uh, to, and it's just amazing to me, the stories of before Christ and after Christ, and, uh, and that's what keeps me motivated, it's what keeps me going, because we want to reach people with the love of Christ, we want them to know they can be forgiven, we want them to know that they don't have to stay the same old way and live under the shame and the guilt and the condemnation from making poor choices or bad decisions. God's at work all over the world bringing what we call revival. He's going to revive men, women, boys, and girls so that they can become what he wants them to be and make the difference that we can make together. All that to be said, let's take a look at the passage of Scripture in, in Ephesians chapter 2. Here's what the Scripture says. And you he made alive. Everybody say alive. In you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. But God, everybody say, but God. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together. This is the resurrection message, that dead people, dead things, uh, dead dreams and dead visions can come alive. If you go back to the New Testament, you'll find out both in Isaiah chapter 60, it's a deep darkness covered the earth. The New Testament said that there were three hours of darkness when the, during the crucifixion. And all that's a reminder that is... It's, um, 
Danielle said so well. She said, listen, no matter what's been broken, Danielle is a, um, what would you call it, Danielle? She, she's a, a potter. I don't know if she's a master potter, but she, she takes things, puts them on a pot, but then she had this other kind of pottery where you take a good pot and you break it, and you put it back together with gold, and you put it all the pieces back together, and it comes out more beautiful than the, the original. And what God was saying today is, listen, I don't know where you can think Jeff was, but I wouldn't want to be in a fight with Jeff. Do you see the size of his hands? <laughs> I'm like, holy cow, that would hurt. You look at, you look at uh, Chris and you think to himself, you know what, could God really restore and, and renew and give him all those R's? Could he, could he really be that guy and then come back and be this guy he is right now? I've watched it before my own eyes. I've seen it. It's true. How many people in this room right now would say wholeheartedly that you are not ashamed of being a Christian? Anybody here? These are all the stories. Everyone has a story. Because we're not following a, an empty religion. We're not following a, 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 an old history lesson that has been passed down for generations. We're literally talking about Jesus is not dead. He's still alive. And he's, the reason we know he's alive is because of stories like that. And so then I got to look at my story, and I thought, okay, I, I wasn't a, a big fighter, probably because I got my butt kicked. I, I wasn't, uh, I, I wasn't um, uh, 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 in trouble when I was a kid, and, and so I'm really messed up. You know why I'm really messed up? Because I was a pretty good guy. And when you're a pretty good guy, you start thinking, I'm amazing. You start thinking, man, I am cool. You began to believe in your own mind that somehow, because you do good works and you do nice things, that somehow you are literally better than, than others. And I remember as a teenager giving my heart to Christ and said, Lord, will you, will you come in? I'll never forget the first Bible study I was in as a new Christian. The, the leader of the Bible study said, you need to ask the Holy Spirit to come shine a light in your heart and show you your heart. And so this is, this is how prideful and arrogant I was, I, I'm like, see this light right here? I'm like, Holy Spirit, this is going to be amazing. You're going to tell me how wonderful I am, how great I am, and how many things I've done nice. I, I used to shovel sidewalks for older women and, and not charge them. All the good stuff. Just go ahead and tell me how wonderful I am. I'm like a legend in my own mind. And I'll never forget when the Holy Spirit light came on in my heart, it began to reveal the most gross, sick, selfish. And I'm thinking to myself, I could live my life faking it till I make it. I could live a life just trying to pretend I'm something out here. But at that moment, and it seems to be a theme, both of those guys got emotional when they began to realize that they were at the end of themselves. And I remember crying for three days, not understanding how that ugly, sinful, prideful, selfishness could be on the inside of me. I mean, I'm, honestly, I could believe it was inside Chris. <laughs> but to see it revealed in my own heart, I, I literally did what the Bible says and I began to recognize repentance. And here's my challenge. I, I was so full of myself that when I did ask forgiveness, I could, I could forgive other people, I could forgive everyone else. But the hardest challenge I had was to forgive myself. Because I pretend that I was all this. Yeah, I grew up Catholic, and in my Catholic faith, if you did good works, you, you believed the, the good works were the what, things that saved you, the, the things that made you look good, that made you who you were. But I recognized it wasn't my good works that could save me any longer. And I cried, and I wept, and I said, God, I, I want to serve you all the days of my life. And I, from that moment on, I just said, listen, I'm not going to be perfect. I, I can't do it all well, but what I do want to do is I want to share with other people, that God has a purpose and a plan, that he can forgive them of their sins, that they could actually come to their purpose again. Anybody fly lately? Anybody fly in an airplane lately? It's not all that's cracked up to be. You know, right now they say you've got to show up at least two hours early, and if you know my wife, she's got to be there two and a half hours early because she wants to be early to be early for the early, right? And, I, and I'm like, I'd probably go to the airport 20 minutes before, right, one of those guys. Anyway, we get on the thing. We get there early, 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 because I'm with Cheryl, and we're traveling through the airport. We're getting coffee. We know we have plenty of time. But all of a sudden, we found out that our gate 
was like, it seemed like 150 miles away. And we hear over the loudspeaker, you, your flight is leaving. And we're like, wait a minute. It, it, we're supposed to, we're here early. So her and I start running, right? So we're running through the airport. We're running through the airport. We're running through the airport, running through the airport, running through the airport. Finally, we see the door. Literally, we get close to the door and the lady says, we're closing the door. We're like, no, 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 I, we're here. Boom, the door shuts. And we missed our plane. I don't know how you deal with that, but in that moment I was thinking to myself, this is crazy. What do we do? Where do we go? How do we get a flight? What, all these things are going through my mind. And then I began to think that the church is a lot like the ark. And how Noah was trying to get people to come in the ark. We're trying to get people to church today. We're not trying to get people to church because we want big numbers. We're not trying to get people to church because we want their money. We're not trying to get people to church just so we can say we went to church. We want to make sure that the door does not slam in anyone's face when they get ready to stand before God and say, I want to follow Jesus. So this Resurrection 2024 service was meant for you to understand that we're not serving a dead religion. We're not following somebody else's rules. What we're trying to do is discover how God can save one person at a time, and then we're so grateful and thankful for a Savior who rose from the dead, who's got real power to change and transform lives. That I don't have to be what I used to be that God can make me into something new. God didn't come to make bad people good. He came to transform our lives. And because of that, it doesn't need just a a few verses. It needs resurrection power. The Bible says that the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. So what does that mean? It means your marriage can be better than it's ever been if you're willing to follow Him. Will it be easy? No. Who said it's easy? One of the things I love about Christians is we're not supposed to be just good leaders when everything goes our way. We're supposed to be good leaders even when we're in their valleys, even when difficult challenges are in front of us. The Marines taught Chris from from probably the day he got in how to adapt, improvise, and overcome. And as a Christian, that's the mission. Everything in the kitchen sink has been thrown at many of you, and, and the enemy's doing everything he can to get you to curse God and die. And this Easter Sunday, God wants you to know that you're not alone, that he rose from the dead so that you could be raised to newness of life, that you're alive. And it's time for us, listen, it's time for us to live Christianity in such a way where people don't think we're good people. I don't care about being good anymore. I tried to be good a lot of my life. It wasn't good enough. But I want people to see that Jesus is alive and Jesus is in Chris. That's why Chris can tell his story. That's why he's in Jeff, so Jeff can tell his story. And all of you that raised your hands a few moments ago, you may not be perfect, you may not be all together, but you know that you're not the same person you used to be. Let me finally read this last passage and we'll go. It says, Among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, the uh, end of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved through faith, listen, and not of yourselves. You can't save yourself. You can't do good enough. You can't give enough. What Jesus said is, I will do it for you, but you're going to have to trust me. And this morning, I'd like you to bow your heads with me because I want to give an invitation before the door is slammed. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. I know what it's like regularly to do funeral services for children and for adults and for seniors. I I do them all the time, and I I gasp sometimes because I want to know, did they know the Lord? Were they they quit playing games and get serious with God so that if they passed away, they'd, they'd know that they have confidence According to 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, it says, These things are written unto you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you might know that you have eternal life. This church wants you to know that you can have eternal life, not because of your good works, but because Jesus can transform your life. If you're here this morning, and you may have known Jesus your whole life in your head, 
But I'm talking about your heart today. I'm talking about Him resurrecting you and making you alive on the inside. When I count to three, I'm going to ask, if you say yes to Christ, when you put your hand up, you're simply surrendering, saying, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. I don't care if you grew up in the church. Chris said he grew up in the church. But there was enough pressure at 16 that he decided to follow the God that his mom followed. And today we need to follow the God, listen, who loves us and has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. One, two, this is for for believers. Listen, it's for people who know God in their head but not their heart. One, two, three. Put your hand up real quickly. Say, Pastor, that's me. Hands all over this room. For those of you that lifted your hand, would you pray this prayer with me? Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I believe you died on the cross and you rose again to give me a new life. We receive you right now. Can we thank the Lord for all those that raised their hands? Listen. It's not about church entity. It's about coming alive. And if you raised your hand, you said, I want to come alive. I want to be a Christian. I want to follow God. Then the next step is that you need to find a life-giving church that will help you grow, get you involved, use your time, your talents, use your treasures so that we can make sure that no one gets a, a door slammed in their face and that they can say yes to Christ. How many believers here are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus? The Holy Spirit was given to the church, listen, so that you would be bold and make sure that no one gets to the door and getting ready to get on their plane and the door shut in front of them. It's our job, listen, to boldly proclaim that they can be forgiven. Aren't you glad God didn't give up on Chris? Aren't you glad God didn't give up on Jeff? Aren't you glad that God didn't give up on me? Listen, aren't you glad God didn't give up on you? That's what Easter service is all about. Don't make it about religion and want to fight and debate me on theological issues. I'm not here because I'm a deep theologian, although I've studied the Bible now 40 years. It wasn't about how smart I am. It's about an 18-year-old kid who thought he was full of himself and needed a savior and a way out. And God saved me, forgave me, and called me to do his work. That's what he wants to do with you. Let's pray together. Would you stand with me? Where's uh, Don? Don still here? Did he take off? All right, so let's pray together. Father, you see our hearts. You know that we're about ready to go have some great meal someplace after church. You know you've got plans for us. But Father, we pray right now together as a church family that you would bring fresh life, new life. You said old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We can shed off yesterday and we can lean into tomorrow because of your resurrection life. We thank you for it in Jesus' name.